Welcome back to part two of our conversation with Elizabeth Velez of readingmotherhood.com. So if you missed our slightly fiery conversation in part one, you want to go back to that. We're talking about some really serious stuff and we're going to get to good ways for us to get through this, I know. But please belly up back at that bar and give that a listen first. And don't worry, we'll save your seat right here for you. So Elizabeth, like I said, we got a little fiery. We talked yes. about how you were in New York. And what I'd like for us to do is um, go back to where we were and let's find out. Let's take your journey from when she, when you were, you know you're in New York, you did get married, you had a child, yes. correct? Or two children, right? But you, too. Yeah, but you ended up in Texas again. You went yes, back to the I South. Did. Let's talk, like, can we pick it up there? Because this is important how, how where this is a great space. Let's do. And I also, we will get to a point where I talk about the work that I do that is so incredibly joyful. Yes. And that is so important. Yes. So, very quickly, um, this is very conventional. Fell madly in love. Got married. My husband was from Dallas. His whole goal in life had been to get to New York. So when he was 18, he got a scholarship to Columbia, wow. lived in New York. Um, Slight overachiever. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it was a shock to yeah. his system. He was first in his generation, in his family, to go to college. Um, so we moved back to Dallas. Um, partly, I had my first child, um, Stephen, who is now... 51 years old, which I can't even believe I have a 51-year-old son. And so we're back in Texas. We have a community there. He was working for as a journalist for a Eyewitness News on Channel 4, which meant we got to drive in the Eyewitness News car at a Rolling Stones concert and things <laughs> like that. So that was good. Um, and... He then worked for PBS Channel 13, that's Jim Lehrer Show Newsroom. Yeah. I did say to you, all young women should think long and hard about following any man to Texas, probably anywhere else. So, you know, just think about it. But, so Roe versus Wade happened. And a week later, I was working at a clinic in Dallas that had been operating. And it was the ideal place. The doctor took care of women in a way. I have been with some of my students to clinics in the last few years. It was an amazing place. It was a model. Things have changed then. When people came and picketed the clinic, we went out and gave them hot chocolate. I did a lot of radio debates with right to life people some of which were four hours long, and now I'm thinking, how did, why did I, whatever did I? And my friend Charlotte, who I talked about earlier, was also at that clinic. So, but I guess I want to fast forward a little. So Stephen, after he was born, I knew that I wasn't going to do that work forever. And I sort of, when I say checkered career, I look back past that, and I thought, you know, I've had these teaching jobs, I haven't known how to be a teacher. And so it seemed important to me to start thinking about going to graduate school. Soon, when Stephen was five or six, we lived in Texas. He's a journalist. I'm at the clinic, which happened to be around the corner from one another. I was a precinct chair for George McGovern when he was running against Richard Nixon wow. in 1972. And we thought Dallas County would go for George McGovern, which it would now. And that's something, Gina. It is something. It is. I mean, if you were there then, because I think he got seven votes back wow. in Dallas County. But anyway, we then came to Washington. Um, my husband got a job, the Office of Civil Rights at what was then Health, Education, and Welfare. So for me, it seemed I need to go to graduate school. I had a teaching, part-time teaching job in a, a little private school that was in a temple in D.C., but it was for D.C. public school students. And I thought, no, I still don't. No. So that's where Georgetown comes into my life. And I have to say, Georgetown 
it's like a marriage that I just can't quit. <laughs> it's like I've been there 40 years or so. I came as a graduate student, and the, the point of that program was to teach writing in some different kinds of ways. Um, so I did that master's. I started teaching as an adjunct. Then there was a program called the Community Scholars Program. Ricardo worked in that. It was for first-generation students at Georgetown. And I was the academic director of that program for years. And it meant that people would say to me, oh, my God, how can you teach at Georgetown? There are all these white, privileged students. And I'd say, I don't see them a lot. All of my students are first-generation, primarily students of color. Um, but as I stayed, I sort of expanded what I was doing and began to teach other English classes. And again, I feel very lucky because um, I got to choose. So I teach, if we want to talk about motherhood a little bit, yeah. I will, you know, I will say that program at Georgetown is a model. I am retired from that full-time position. Things got more and more administrative. Um, I am not a good tech person. Uh, I don't think I could have, I didn't download what I was supposed to for you guys. <laughs> but I have a colleague that we're very, I'm very close to. And, oh wait, I left something out. So it wasn't until I was at Georgetown that I sort of had this idea, this is what I'm gonna do with my life. Maybe my checkered career is done. And at that time I decided I can have another child. Because for me, to have had two close together, I felt like I would have drowned. And I know there are people who do that better. Um, I'm not sure I believe in a maternal instinct. Um, obviously, both of my children are in my heart forever. But I, I didn't stop thinking, oh, and it, you know, I think you all are so much better at that. My generation, there was just this idea, you went to college, many women in college, they wanted a ring by the time they graduated. Then you get married, then you have kids, and you don't think about it as a choice. And I'm not saying that he didn't make a choice, but I'm saying the ways in which that I internalized, this is what you do. Yeah. So that I chose the first one and then the second one. So Nikki is 12 years younger than Stephen, and he was born while I was at Georgetown. In fact, I was at Georgetown Hospital, supposed to be standing on the lawn getting my degree, and instead I was in the hospital room. So I've been teaching at Georgetown. Georgetown, incredibly supportive of the work that I do. Um, I teach feminist theory, which is a required course for women and gender studies majors. I also teach in the English department. So I teach a, a lot of things. I would say that my position at Georgetown, in some ways, I've taught so many generations of young feminists who go out in the world and do much better work than I ever did. I mean, they truly do. They are writers, they go to law school, and they work for women's organizations. But anyway, so one of the courses that I currently teach, um, one of my friends, colleague, English department, um, had she adopted a daughter from China, they had, she hadn't had kids, she was a little older, and we started talking on the phone about child rearing. We started talking about, you know, what are you expected to do in the playground? It felt like junior high school, there were moms talking to moms. We're like, what is motherhood? What are the expectations? And what we see is for your generation, Gina, the expectations are so rigid, you know, I grew up, and they would say, go outside and don't come back to dinner. Yep. And that doesn't My mom was, if you come back before the street lights come on, you have to exactly. stay in. It was punishment if you came back. I think I've said exactly. this before. <laughs> and we know that's not true. And there's also 
I think sort of started by the media, this mommy wars business, which I don't think it, you know, exists. I have friends who have been stay-at-home mothers, but to make that distinction is and to pit us against one another. Do you know, it's interesting you say that because, you know, I've chosen not to have children. I've talked about this many times. Gina has two children. I don't think I look at Gina and go, I can't believe you had kids. I mean, like, you know what I mean? Like, as a woman who chose (laughs) not to have children, but do you know how many times I've had women, like, Oh, um, like verbally attack me almost yes. or really give put me you know through the through the ringer about choosing not to have children and I'm just like I would never once look at you and say anything negative about why you chose to have children but yet another woman could tell like attack me for for not it's no. a very strange scenario and that that's even a thing I have a very uh, real belief ready about just both sides of that coin I've, I've seen my friends say things and yes. I think it's always what you don't know you're easier to raw okay. on. Yeah. And when you know something, you're easy, you back off of the pain of, like, you know, the struggles of, like, either having a child or not or enjoying your life in one way and, and fulfilling it in another. Yeah. There are – it's not fair for anybody to make that decision for anyone. I feel yeah. like you have, like – First of all, having children is hard, very, very hard. Not having children is also very hard. There's a lot of decisions that come later for you yep. that are not the same decisions that will come for you where you'll be like, my kids will take care of me. Who yeah. takes care of you? Well, do you know what I mean? But, <laughs> I do know what you mean. But I mean, yeah. like, there's a lot yeah. There's a lot to be said about all of it. And then, you know, also, why does everybody think it's okay to just judge everybody else? Or like, to why tell, somebody, that, I, tell I, somebody what they should or shouldn't do why? on that level. And, Mothers in particular, because I do believe that it's what you were saying earlier, Gina, you know, mothers, and there's a way in which in this course, there are communities where a woman like my Aunt Helen Mm -hmm. would be considered doing what's called mother work. And I'm sure that you do mother work in your life as well, Louise. Absolutely. And it's called Dave. <laughs> she mothers him all day long. Puppies. I'm not puppies. No, but I mean, yeah, we were just at a concert on Friday night, and I had a little girl. She was like four, and she, her mom brought her. Her mom said, "This is the last person I had to go on. She was my last choice on a date. <laughs> I, I, it just fell through. She had other kids. The little girl at the end. I, she was not having a good time. And I took. And we were sitting on the lawn, and I started just talking to her like a regular right, human. Like and, a human being. And we were, I was asking her about what she thought and this and that. And at the end, when they left a little early, she came over, grabbed my leg, and said, I love you. Oh, and I it was you. it's cute. It's very cute. Right. I thought that was, and the mom looked at me and said, thank you, thank you. You know, like, because I was helping her enjoy the exactly. concert. Exactly. And I was just taking some of the pressure off. And the little girl was fine. I, she was mad at her mom. So if I talked to her like a human, it was settling everything down. Exactly. And we had like, you know, talked about, Unicorns, I don't know what we talked about, but it was playing that, that role. The, one of the things we do in the course is look at popular culture. And I'm going to give you a sort of statistic that blows my mind. So in 1950, um, if you asked young women what they daydreamed about, and I'll try to find this and send it to you at some point, the answer was almost always, you know, marriage. Da, da, da. And the culture reinforced that. Yep. Two years ago, you asked young women what they daydreamed about, and a majority said having a baby. And we think in this class that we need to deconstruct the popular cultural narrative. You know, we have students who come into this class, it's called Reading Motherhood, and some of them think, oh, this is so great, they're gonna teach us about motherhood. And they kind of think, you know, five years ago they thought, Yes, it's like I can be like Angela Jolene <laughs> and, and wait, yes, yes. And, and Jolena and Brad Pitt and have seven children. And what we're trying to do, the literature that we read, is look at the reality. We also want them to see what the culture does in terms of race I mean, and this gender. This is where you use Rosemary's baby? We do. Okay. And I, I promise <laughs> I'll talk about that in just a minute. But Culturally, this idea of motherhood is mainly confined. It's a nice white middle class woman, you know, just watch a few TV commercials and they're all sitting around the table and everything is wonderful. And what we don't look at, there's a, 
literary theorist at the University of Maryland, who's brilliant, Patricia Hill Collins, and she writes about motherhood, is, you know, community mothering, which is the norm isn't that you are in these two rooms alone with two children forever. Nobody can do that. But that's sort of the expectation. But there are communities, and I know um, my husband's community, Mexican-American in Dallas, their aunts, their cousins, and you're not, it's not that isolation. So if you look at what's written on motherhood right now, more, most of it is white middle-class women talking about how difficult it is to have a child, and it's true. They feel isolated, they feel alone, but we want people to see it was never, ever intended, if you look at cultures globally, that people live alone with their little children, separated from other people. It's, I dare I say it, unnatural. Yeah. Because it's wow. communities. Um, but yes, you want to hear about Rosemary's baby in the class? <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's save it. Gina, do you think we could have a drink before we do Rosemary's baby? That's your enough. Let's do it. Okay. All right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. right now. Here we go. So, so, so little birdie told me that he loves to kill it, and so do I. And so does Louise. So, so is the this is an easy, it's an easy uh, topic to hit for me. So we're gonna start off our drink with um, two ounces of Hornitos Plata, and then we're gonna put in one ounce of Cointreau. And 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 you don't have to be a genius to realize that at this point we're making margaritas. Um, but what we're gonna do is we're going to use um, cantaloupe. Uh, puree that we made in our little tip in the first episode. So again, you can go back and you can listen to that and you'll get your um, cocktail inspiration. So what do you have in there is two ounces of tequila, one ounce of the Cointreau, and then we're gonna put in there um, one ounce of lime juice, and then we're gonna add two ounces of, of um, cantaloupe puree. I'm looking for my knife. And then we are going to use a little bit of tahine, which is one of my favorite um, spices. And you can buy it in the store and it's spelled T-A-J-I-N. So when you're looking for it, you're, however you may think you spell it is not right. This is how you spell it. And it's a nice blend of like um, smoked herbs and salt. And we're gonna use that um, on our cantaloupe for our garnish. So we squeeze in some juice from the lime and we're gonna add our puree, and it's just like nice and fresh. This looks fantastic. It's it's fun. Oops, and you wear it on your shirt a little. <laughs> That's for later, so when you get That's hungry later. later. Yeah, it's for later. <laughs> it's literally on my eyebrows, you know, whatever. Okay. Don't put the tahini in this your eyes. This is why I tell everybody not to um, do two at once in the shaker tin, because then, you will wear it, and there is my answer. You will wear it, so wardrobe change, right? All right, anyways, we're gonna grab some ice, we're gonna shake this and put this over fresh ice. So we're gonna shake this cocktail and strain it over fresh ice, and you have a choice, you know, if you want it like a little bit thicker, you could um, not double strain it. If you want a little bit thinner, you can double strain it, depending on what you like. Um, this makes a great frozen base, so if you wanna like have frozen drinks, you could do that as well. So let's just put the top on, give it a shake. <laughs> the two at once is always so difficult. And I don't know why. It's called a twofer. This looks incredible. Yeah, we're gonna have a nice cocktail. It'll take the edge off, right? I feel like that's one of those things. Yes. And as you know, I brought an espresso with me. Which is drink afterwards. <laughs> which is needed. Oh, this is nice and light. You'll be fine. Nice and light. So I have a question. Um, yep. Do you, the pineapple is just pureed in a blender. You know, cantaloupe. Uh, sorry, cantaloupe. Yep. And you just put it in there, you don't add anything to no, that. No, no more, no okay. extra sugar. Your sugar is the, um, like you have plenty of sugar in the, um, what's it called? Let me just dump this real quick. Uh, you have plenty of sugar in the the, the, the fruit itself and, and also right. 
the Quantrell. Thank you. I couldn't get there. Right. It, takes, it takes a village. I think we already had this discussion, right? <laughs> Take the village. You look hot to you, too. Exactly. Raise a child. But you want to, like, I like this drink double strain because it's not, it's not mealy. If this was frozen, I would have left everything in. It's a work of art. It's messy, but what are you going to do? Um, and then I'm going to take my beautiful fruit that we made earlier and oh, spike it on. Okay, that looks great. Yeah, so you have a little snacky. There we go, you don't need too much. This one's for you. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Oh, that is gorgeous. Do you like it? I mean, that wasn't in the notes if you liked cantaloupe or not. I do like cantaloupe. Cheers. Yeah. Cheers. Um, so for this recipe, you're going to go to um, Designated Drinker on Show. And if you missed the trick on how to make um, cantaloupe puree, you can hit us up at Designated Drinker on the Instagram. Or as Louise so kindly told me, it's called The Gram. <laughs> um, <laughs> and if you have any questions, you know, connect with me. Hit me up. DM me. I am totally into it. Yep. And then what we'll also do is make sure that there's links um, so that anyone who's interested can find readingmotherhood.com so okay. learn more about what you are doing, Elizabeth, and all the amazing things that you're doing. I know you're very humble in saying you don't, but the real these women are doing great things because you inspired them and you touched them at some point in time. So thank you for all that you're doing. And for those of you, who, um, just so you're listening, if you want these things, you can just scroll through down through the episode notes and all these links will be there. Or like Jenna said, you can hit us up on designatedrinker.com show or the grams or even the Facebook still we're still there so all right so now we have cocktail in hand um and we're talking about what I've been wanting waiting for all this time Rosemary's baby dun, 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 dun. okay and it, I think what this will do is give you a good idea of how the course works um what we're doing academically um first of all I want to say that when we show Rosemary's Baby in the motherhood class, we it's sort of chronological, the class we're looking. So it was like late 60s. And we go from after the war, when men came home from the war, women had been doing everything on their own. Mm -hmm. Men came home, and there was this sweet to go back to women staying at home. Um, and I'll give you, I promise it's going to connect. A great example of that, I'm not talking conspiracies, <laughs> but if you look at women's magazines during the war, any women's magazine during the war, and it's Rosie the Riveter, women are great, women can weld, and after the war, it's um, women are now going to stay home and repopulate and care for the home and children every day. Okay, so Rosemary's Baby starts at the beginning, it's set in the beginning of the 60s. When we show that film, we talk to the students about who and what Roman Polanski is. I don't want anyone to see that film who doesn't want to. Yeah. And I completely understand that. And we talk about that, we put it in context. And then we've never had a student say, we're, there's also a horrific sexual assault scene in that film. And I have had students, we talk about that explicitly, who say, I'm going to skip that. And we say, absolutely, and you don't have to watch the film. And then what we say to them, this is your reading. This belongs to you when you see this film. So very quickly, for those of you who haven't seen it, a young couple moves into the Dakota, which is this great building in Manhattan. Um, John Lennon lived there. John Lennon was shot in front of it. Oh, really? Huh. Yeah. Um, a lot of famous people have lived there. It's supposedly haunted. And Rosemary's played by Mia Farah. And she's married to an aspiring actor. And what happens is a couple lives next door. They're witches. They're older. And what they want is for her to have Satan's child. She is totally, all she wants, all Rosemary wants, and it's interesting to think about, is to have a baby. And she is dressed in little gingham, lacy column. She looks like a little girl, which our students point out 
a lot. So she is assaulted by the devil. Her child, they tell her, her whole pregnancy is absolutely controlled. She tries to go to different doctors. Everybody is part of this witch's coven. Uh, when she goes through the pregnancy, she is drugged. The baby is gone. She is told that the baby died. She finds out that the baby didn't die. She gets a giant knife and goes, and there's this, it ends with this huge cradle and her looking into the cradle with a knife saying, what have you done to its eyes? And the expression on her face, it's hard to read. Is she going to, my students, interpret the lighting, you know, we're doing this analysis as she's going to mother that child because that's what mothers do. Mothers sacrifice. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how it's, you know, they became a mother. Um, but there are all these implications in it that at that time you can interpret it as a critique of the way pregnant women were treated in the United States. Oh, interesting. She's very sick during her pregnancy. The doctors tell her, oh, that always happens. The doctors control what is clearly. She's in pain. She, and they just, that happens. Women get pregnant. There's one moment when she's with a group of her women friends, and they're like, this isn't right. This doesn't happen. And her husband, whose name happens to be named Guy, because he's just a guy, oh, interesting. comes in and tells these women to leave her alone. And the underlying plot, he is working with the witches, and he is an actor, oh. and they're helping him, they're helping his career. So you don't trust the father to have your best interest. Doctors will control you. You ask questions, they will tell you, oh, women just get the strangest ideas in their head. Um, you know, now I think the expression is mommy fog. Oh, women yeah. have mommy fog and when they have babies. So it really is interpreted. The students, on one hand, hate it. On the other hand, they see it as a serious critique of what happened to women then. There weren't any birthing centers. There weren't any women doing midwifery. It was almost all male doctors. So you can see it as sort of male supremacy. Um, and just it's a tiny addition to that story. So when I had Stephen, my first child, um, the night before I had him and he was not due, we went to watch Rosemary's Baby and he came <laughs> early the next day. So Rosemary's Baby is this huge joke in our family. And everybody's seen it and they're like, oh, that's what made you come early, Stephen. And it is true. I was like, Whoa. Was he a demon spawn child, though? Exactly. No. <laughs> He's such a good boy, you know. <laughs> I bent over backwards to make sure he wasn't the child of the devil. <laughs> but that's a kind of cultural analysis that we do. We look at a lot of first-person memoirs by women who are talking about their pregnancy or talking about their child. We also look because we think we think that when this desire for so many young women that is so supported by the media to have a child. Sure is. So think of the words he is. I want to have a baby. And it's kind of like, uh, yeah, but do you want to have an 11-year-old? Do you know what an 11-year-old is like? And it gets so romanticized into this lovely infant and babies can be wonderful but also very difficult creatures yeah. but this idea I want to have a baby and we sort of think you know I want to raise a child would be a better way to put it there's something about babies we know there's um, for many younger women it feels like I'm going to have somebody that loves me only unconditionally. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot we read that is upsetting because we are disturbing the cultural messages. Yeah. But there's a lot of brilliant writers 
right now who are offering more diverse voices and more diverse cultural messages. That's so interesting. And as you say that, it's, again, being a woman who chose, went to great lengths to make sure I didn't have children. It wasn't like, let's be clear, I went to great lengths to make sure it didn't happen. Um, it's interesting is that you're like, people have a thing for babies. I never have the thing. I've never had the thing for Me babies. Either. When people are like, oh, do you want to hold the baby? I'm like, no. no. Now, Dave, my husband, absolutely. First thing he wants to do. I'm like, no, no, not really. And then I get demonized for that. But I'm like, at this point in my life, I'm like, no, I really don't want to hold the baby. And they're like, oh, but they smell good. You baby smell I'm like, uh, I smell sometimes vomit, they do. <laughs> breast milk, or Poo. I don't know how what any of that is. is equates to, but every it's euphoric for other people, and I literally have none of that. But now, if you give me a child like that little girl at the concert, there was a space that I could communicate. There was an exchange, and she was probably I don't know, maybe five. That's where my like kick in. And now, don't get me wrong, I don't ever look back and go, I wish I had, right. or I would like to take this one home. Never do I have that ever cross my mind. Um, but I enjoy that time. Right. But that, yeah, I don't understand the baby euphoric thing. I really don't. People well, would bring them. This one up. smells great. I'm like, it doesn't, <laughs> it smells doesn't like. Smell so good. No. <laughs> I'm like, and everyone's like, aren't newborns? They're like, aren't. Aren't they cute? And I'm like, no, they look like a shriveled up old and, person. And they're kind of. <laughs> they're not cute. And they're kind of terrifying because you have this thing and you think, how do you do this? Yeah. You know, what if I drop it? Yep. Um, its head is too big. It's like proportionally incorrect. It's, it can, you know, it's not. <laughs> but I mean, I do think that, you know, I have two daughters in law. That's how you yeah, say it, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So one of them, like you. Um, Louise, my son Nick, and Megan, they are not, they do not want to have a child. As you said, Megan gets told over and over and over, you'll change your mind, you'll change your mind. They kind of leave Nick alone. Yeah. It, this gets directed at women. Yep. And then I have my son Stephen and his wife, and they have two little boys. And what I will say is I enjoyed toddlerhood honestly, in a way that I did not when I had my own children with the grandchildren. But part of that was because they went away. <laughs> I mean, that sounds so terrible. But, you know, when we had them, we really could devote, you know, just play with them, be with them, you know, feed them, laugh with them. But you can't do that in real life if you work, if you have other things in the world. And... I believe that the work that I do in the world, it's, there's no way. You know, people say this thing. Like, you know, when you're on your deathbed, you're never going to regret the work you didn't do. You know, you're going to think about family and loved ones. And I think when I'm on my deathbed, I know that I will regret that I haven't written more poetry. I will regret that there was another kind of teaching I might have done. But I feel like that kind of statement is this accepted kind of truth. And it's not. We have work in the world to do. Children, raising children, having children, dealing with children can be a part of that work. That's what I see. Yeah. And this terrible division we've made between work and family doesn't have to be. It doesn't. You know, it's kind of like this common thread, and I know if you let's go back to part one, it got we got really deep in, in, into a space that is very important for us to talk about, and that is the overturning of Roe versus Wade. So if you haven't listened to that, please go back. But I think that, in all honesty, the, the common thread through all of this is choice. Yes. We should all, as women, have choice. Yes. Everyone should have a choice. But yes, women but I mean, should, I mean specifically because we're talking about women today. should too. I'm mean, no, no, I'm saying definitely should. But like, no, you're right. Everyone should have choice because, as you said earlier, as one of us loses our rights, there's somebody that it, the next that it will affect the, an, another person and for other. It's like coming. when somebody says, "I can't do something with my body," believe me, when they are definitely coming, like you said, to gay gay marriage rights or transition, uh, trans, the trans world, birth uh, control, birth control, all of those things. Um, and then we start talking about travel, which is an interesting the thing. The idea that you cannot go, and I don't want to 
bring her up and belabor it. It's a little 10-year-old girl who had to go to Illinois or Ohio. I'm not sure. Horrible. She's from Ohio. She's from Ohio. So she had to go to Indiana. Yeah. So they're now investigating that doctor and da-da-da-da-da. But it's and awful what happened to that little girl. It's, it's unbelievably awful. That's another thing. Awful. We, and that's another thing people don't understand about why abortion or things like that happen. Like incest, rape. Oh, my God. Forget it. Like, and then, you know, and then there's just like normal things that happen like... You know, uh, the baby won't be until term that you're expected to carry till it dies, and then, then you have to go through that kind of like trauma. Why when you don't have to? Yeah. When my so okay, let's take away heart, you know, heart medication for men. Men are mostly on heart medication, right? So, oh, you're gonna have, you can't go to your cardiologist anymore. You can't go to make sure your heart's going okay. We see that there's a clot coming. Let's just wait till it hits. Yeah. Let's just see what happens. Do you survive? Here's what I think. It's fucked up. I think that men, you know, the Bible says <laughs> that men should not spill their seed. Men are just squandering yeah. potential children. And I think, you know, let's put a stop to that. Let's have a little electroid that every time a man gets ready to squander his <laughs> seed, it's an electric shock. That was my husband's idea. <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, <laughs> and my husband's really, like, forward thinking. You know, he doesn't. He was like, he's just as upset as I am. But there are people in, you know, where we live in, in Maryland that think it's fucking great what happened. And like, you really quickly draw a line in the sand where it's like, not only do we not talk about it, we, we don't, I was like, we, I, you can't, I cannot have them in our house anymore. And these are people that I spent time with. I had no idea that they were so religious that I was like, I was like, you, you hear what you're saying. You have girls. You literally have girls in your family. You have daughters and granddaughters. And you're saying that this didn't be this their choice. I'm like, you're out of your, are you in another planet that no one knows where, where you are? What's really interesting is that you, you yourself are a religious person. You take the girls to yeah, they're, to to I'm ca- yes. they're, you're Catholic, which is Catholic light. Yeah, but still, <laughs> but I mean, that, but that that is your that is your faith, but you are able to see beyond that those those and, and those parameters and 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 identify that this is a part of you, but this is something else that's very important to not just you, but the rest of the world He's as well. It's against the church to have an abortion. I, I, yes. I will tell you that. Yes, where I go to church though. They are not, and, and I'm t- my priest is wonderful, and he's a very kind man, and he's very open to everything. You know, you, gay community, gay marriage, um, things happen in this world, cruel things happen in this world. He is one of the Catholic priests that are like, you know, maybe it's time for a change. There are priests that are not, everyone, you know, isn't no. a no. molester and in that's, the Catholic that's, religion. That's my point is I wanted to say that you can be a complex thinker and think and still have religion in your life. But there, there are life. priests there are, for change. Yeah, There's a yeah. whole They're movement nuns. as well. I mean, that are trying to petition right. the Catholic Church to change this law or rule, just change this outlook, it. Yeah. This outlook of how it's interpreted. Right? I mean, absolutely. That's it's and, an interpretation um, of the Bible. Listen, Georgetown University has an LGBTQ oh, yeah. center on campus. Yeah. It was hard fought, but it's there. I delivered my and, babies there. Oh, you did? Mm-hmm. I delivered Nikki there. <laughs> well, I didn't deliver Nikki. Yeah, but, yeah. I, had my, <laughs> I had my children <laughs> at Georgetown. I, my mother and everybody, you know, devout Catholic, and like I, I'm saying, like, you, it, the world is changing. And people need to change with it. Because, like, do you want to go back to, like, walking everywhere? Because I fucking doubt that. Nope. You know what I mean? Nope. Like, I don't think you want to live in a thatched, you know, uh, house, you know, that you know, and then, you know, I don't know. I don't know. You, you, went, know. By, you went to go live out on a farm with chickens and ducks. <laughs> Quite the same. But you know what I mean? Like, you have no. to evolve. No, it, absolutely. Think you have to evolve with the, the beings that we're becoming. And, like, if you think, we just think so... I don't know. It's so bizarre to me. It is bizarre. So I have one. Uh, so this is how we know if you listen to our podcast or not. We're going to lighten the, um, we always lighten the mood at the end. Okay. So in this day and age, everyone believes in some sort of spirit animal. And they identify with it, right? And so maybe because of your vast learning, how long you've been at Georgetown, you identify with, um, um, I can't even think what the animal is at Georgetown. Oh, I don't know. 
What's the animal? It's, it's a bulldog. Bulldog. It's a bulldog. I don't. All right, yeah. hold on, hold on. I'll change it. <laughs> change it. You identify with the um, turtle. I don't know. Okay. Do you really like, want me to say wait. what is my spirit animal? No, no, no. <laughs> no, you might identify with the sea turtle because they live forever and they, they glide through the oceans. They can travel everywhere in the world, right? If you can identify yourself as one spirit ingredient or spirited ingredient, um, whether it goes in food or drink, what is something that you you would be like? So um, I really think you all have left me no choice <laughs> in terms of that. This is one of the most golden things I have ever had to drink. And if I, we're talking spirits the wrong way, but I think I must have to say tequila. Yeah, I mean, that's I mean, what say. else yeah. can I say? Yeah, I say it all the time. <laughs> and this is one of the best conveyors of tequila that I've ever had. Oh, wow. And I'm going to make it. I am going to make it. Whether you're whether you're lying to me or not, I'm going to take the platter. <laughs> I haven't lied about a single thing. We're well, fabulous. Thank, thank you, you so much thank for being you. here. Cheers. Thank, cheers. thank you for sharing cheers. so cheers. much cheers. of yourself. Cheers. I don't cheers. want to share the coffee. There we go. There we go. Cheers. The Designated Drinker Show is produced by Missing Link, a podcast media company that is dedicated to connecting people to intelligent, engaging, and informative content. Also in the Missing Link lineup of podcasts is Roger That, a podcast dedicated to guiding you through the haze of dementia, led by skilled caregivers Bobby and Mike Carducci. Now, if you're looking for a whole new way to enjoy the theater, check out Between Acts, an immersive audio theater podcast experience. Each episode takes you on a spellbinding journey through the works of newfound playwrights, from dramas to comedies and everything in between. Find Missing Link's League of Podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you find your podcasts. Please don't forget to subscribe, download, and review the shows. Your review helps our shows reach new audiences. To find out more about Missing Link, visit missinglink.company. That's missinglink.company. 